approach throughout the World Summit on the Information Society. And we did so because of our long tradition of working with NGOs. We had for each of our specialized principle of universal access, of freedom of expression, of linguistic and cultural diversity and education for all, we engaged these specialized agencies and we became the conduit for their ideas to the discussions and debate in both the phases and preparatory processes of the World Summit on the Information Society. So our, our experience of engaging in this uh, kind of debate and discussion and, ha and benefiting from a multi-stakeholder, because today, uh, I mean, especially in the area of information and communication technologies, really, government's resources are meager, very limited. You cannot afford not to do business with the private sector. This is something that within UNESCO, uh, our sector has really been in the forefront of building a proactively partnership. Of course, we have, as I mentioned and I repeat, that we have been working with the NGO sector and we work extremely well. There are new NGOs that have become our partners. But what is new about UNESCO that we have, we have been actively promoting a partnership with the private sector, uh, with the civil society. And of course, we are an intergovernmental organization. So the answer to your long answer to your brief question is, yes, we believe that this process of multi-stakeholder partnership is here to stay as far as UNESCO's approach to engaging in discussions and debates on issues such as this. Have we exhausted the audience completely? Big city. Oh, yes. uh, the groups of people in the, co in the community wish to set up their own little network of uh, information exchange mm. free for the society using reused equipment. They could not get a radio frequency, mm. even though it was a digital one, because the government controls it and the big powers playing in, the, in that sector grab all those frequencies and none were allocated to the community. On yeah. the point you've just made about collaboration with the private sector, I'm quite fascinated by that approach because the UNESCO approach is about participating and engaging the, in the society. So it's not about the government and it's not about people who commercially do things. It's about society itself using the information and expressing their uh, uh, thoughts and developing from it. And the best examples on the internet sector and ensure they actually enable to in fact to develop, in other words, meet the aspirations that you very clearly have articulated. So I'm a little bit puzzled wow. by the use and your... You are little, you're not the only one who's... About, I mentioned rural communities, partly because I come from a rural area here and I have, to, I have the right to, to be biased. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, also, this, that's where majority of people who are deprived of access to information and knowledge. But, but I'm not saying that there are no poor people in urban centers. Certainly there are, especially now that last, this year, I believe 2008 was the year when the world population is now, half of the world population, if not more, now lives in cities. So we, we cannot constantly say that the access to information is important only for people in remote rural areas. Of course it is important to those living in city, cities who are deprived of ex, their expression and so on. Um, there's, in fact, in this country there is likely to be some 4,000 community radios. That is what I hear from the officials. Now I'm sure that out of those 4,000, they can distribute some frequencies in the urban centers as well for, for those communities that do not have their voice. But I am not in the, I can only when I meet the officials next time that I can say that this is a concern that people have in our open forum have, have expressed. But UNESCO is not in a position to determine or decide about the policies of government of India. Um, I, I believe that was uh, just just one minute. Uh, do you want to add to that? No, maybe just briefly that that I, I, I very much agree with you. But had a brief comment from you. 
Uh, can you give the microphone? Oh. Yeah. Oh. The conflict between two ladies. Uh, CMCs. And um, I'm interested to know uh, what your plans are for the future of these CMCs and how that maybe also connects with um, some of the questions that have been asked uh, with regards to uh, community radios. Well, Mike developed some models. We have generated some community of practices. We have produced some resource material, for example, how to start and run a community multimedia center. We have also done some uh, ethnographic research work in what impact it has on societies. So it is work of this generic nature that UNESCO will continue to pursue, but pursue this along with other organizations such as IDRC, that is the tele, you know, especially telecenter.org, and many other entities within regions that we work with. But our work has to be that of a catalyst rather than going and doing it is, is simply not possible a, for, for an organization that works for 193 countries to go and create thousands of community multimedia centers. Of course, un unless Bill Gates is writing to write, is willing to write some fifty mil billion dollar check to UNESCO, uh, we will not be in a position to create. Um, I have no, I have no problem asking him. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, the idea of human rights, and uh, also, I will add to your concept of the 3D. The I will tell you the 3A, which is accessibility, affordability and availability. And that's a big problem, especially in countries like mine and uh, Mexico, that uh, what you said is beautiful, you know, the multi-stakeholderism seems like uh, a marriage made in heaven. The reality is something else. The reality, especially the concentration of media is making uh, the biggest threatens to communitarian radios. You have here thousands. We just have 12 permissions. Uh, it took more than 40 years to give those permissions that now uh, are threatened by the, uh, the, 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 the uh, monopolies, uh, the commercial monopolies, uh, uh, who owns the whole networking system uh, in my country. And uh, of course, uh, uh, you can t we can talk about uh, internet, radio, etc. The reality is very few. 60% of population is, uh, have no access to, uh, to, to internet. And we are not talking about uh, this, uh, disabled people, or uh, etc. So uh, the reality is something else. Uh, Eighty-nine uh, journalists have been killed just in this year in my country. You know. Well, the last one particularly is of in the world, and we have a network of, of course. Uh, journalist Safety, Journalist Safety Institute, we work with IFG, a number of other uh, organizations that are in this space. It is very, very unfortunate indeed that people have to pay ultimate price with their life for doing the work that they are expected to do. It's the question about the, I have to say that I am a little more optimistic uh, on this issue. Yes, in this country there was only one broadcaster, state broadcaster. That no longer is the case. There, are, there is a proliferation of television channels. Unfortunately, in case of radio, that is not. Yes, FM radio for entertainment, yes. But not so much for community radio. Now, there is some enlightened leadership in this particular area. And things are, in fact, the last information that I received, they are worried that it is not moving fast enough. So I'm sure that the forces of technology and community of practices from other parts of the world will somehow have a positive influence even in Mexico to open this space for self-expression. I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic about it. Of course, I cannot 
do anything about it, except perhaps when I see the ambassador of Mexico next time, I will broach the subject with, to him. But we can do something. I mean, when we work together with you, together with an organization like AMARC, with the civil society groups in your own country, with, with journalists and journalist organizations there, we can at least try to raise awareness, we can try to uh, provide the advocacy, and we can try as an intergovernmental organization to be in direct contact with your government also in order to try to make it clear to them why it is backwards to be so restrictive in the outsourcing, so to say, of, of licenses. But I think we all recognize that you're very, very right. This is still steep uphill in, in many, many countries. Well, thank you very much for um, your presence here this afternoon and for your thoughts and observations on the issues that are very important to UNESCO. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Excuse me, uh, everybody, I'd like to make an announcement. Someone currently has my bag, the IGF bag, and the person doesn't have any identifiable object in his bag. So if uh, you, you like to check your bag and see whether you have your own bag, so please. Bag Sorry? How does the bag look? Is it a backpack? Or yes, the IGF or a backpack. Okay. And there's a last and found uh, desk uh, uh, behind the registration desk. The person may leave, leave the, the bag there, please. Thank you. working right okay so I think we'll get uh, started uh, good afternoon uh, welcome to uh, our uh, workshop on uh, IDNs myths and opportunities uh, this workshop is um, organized by uh, ICANN the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers together with uh, the at-large advisory committee of ICANN ALAC and the um, Asia Pacific uh, regional um, at-large organization APRALO uh, I'd like first to um, welcome and uh, introduce our uh, panelists. Uh, so to my uh, far right, we have uh, Chris Despain. Uh, Chris Despain is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the um, AU Domain Administration and is also the Chairman of the Country Code uh, Name Supporting Organization under ICANN. Next to Chris. Uh, we have Patrick Falstrom. Uh, Patrick is a senior consulting engineer with Cisco and uh, is also uh, heavily involved in the um, IETF work in relation to the IDN protocol uh, revision. 
next to Patrick, we have Hong Chu. Uh, she's representing Apiralu, and she's also a professor at the um, Beijing uh, Normal University. Then we have uh, Ram Mohan. Uh, Ram is uh, Chief Technical Officer and Vice President of uh, Affilius. And last but not least, Manel Ismail. She is Director of International Coordination uh, at the uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority of uh, Egypt. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, so this um, uh, workshop, as the title uh, tells, is about uh, IDNs. It's about the uh, methods, opportunities, as well as challenges. Uh, uh, about uh, about IDNs. IDNs, as you all know, uh, has been there for um, quite some time on on the second level. Uh, what the uh, the ICANN community uh, has been working on over the past uh, few years is to introduce IDNs on the uh, top level of the uh, domain name uh, system. Uh, this uh, work actually involves a number of. Uh, um, uh, areas and uh, th these areas are uh, very um, uh, interconnected uh, together. Uh, there is a lot of work um, taking place uh, at the technical level uh, within IETF. Uh, there is uh, other uh, work in relation to um, IDN guidelines uh, taking place uh, within uh, ICANN on a global level as well as in uh, some regions uh, on, on regional and national uh, uh, levels. Uh, there is also um, uh, work at the um, uh, registry level where uh, policies are uh, required in order to um, um, expand the IDN use on the second level as well as to uh, introduce IDNs on, on the top level. Uh, so uh, what you are uh, going to hear today from the uh, panelists uh, is basically uh, how uh, these uh, 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 efforts uh, uh, get together and why um, it is important to coordinate the work uh, being done in, in one uh, area or at, at one level with, with other uh, work. Uh, we're going to try to identify some of the um, uh, uh, myths about about IDNs, some of the challenges and the opportunities uh, as well. Uh, so basically, if we look at at IDNs, there are different um, uh, uh, perceptions about about IDNs and what IDNs can do uh, to the end users. Uh, and uh, perhaps we can start with the same thing. Thank you. and um, how the various policies fit together. So this will be a, a pretty short presentation, but to save more time for questions afterwards. Uh, I presume that most of you already know how the inter internationalized domain names work. Uh, we have decided to use the Unicode um, character set. We have, defi we have uh, chosen to uh, use the properties that Unicode Consortium has defined when we are selecting the code points. We choose policies based on those, um, uh, on those properties, for example, the directionality of code points, what script the code points belongs to, whether they are graphical characters or alphabetic or numeric, etc. And then we have a, a mixed inclusion-exclusion based mechanism to decide and a rule-based uh, mechanism in the new version of, of I, the IDNA standard um, that makes it possible to use those rules that we define in the standard and calculate whether code points are valid or not to use in the protocol. So what, what this standard creates is a, is a number of layers of policies. So at the bottom, okay, um, this is badly centered, unfortunately. And at least on the monitor, I don't really see the whole picture, but it doesn't really matter. Let's, let's hope it works. Um, so at the bottom, you have the whole character set of Unicode. So you have all possible code points. And of course, all of those code points are not uh, uh, assigned uh, today. There are still unassigned code points as part of the Unicode um, uh, code point set. But out of those Unicode code points, we select a subset, and that is the, the protocol itself. So the protocol allows a certain set of code points, but just because the protocol is allowed, it's not good to use all of those in domain names. That sounds a little bit weird, but that's actually how it is. 
And the reason for that is that if you want to have a domain name based on a specific script, then you have only have a subset of the protocol valid code points which make sense to use in that script. So if it is the case that you would like to have, for example, um, all the code points in a label to belong to the same script, then there are some code points that are protocol valid that you cannot use or cannot mix. But also that is not enough for a policy uh, quite often. It's also the case that you're for a language. You have, you, in a language, you use a subset of a script. So if it is the case that you want to ha use code points valid in a language in a label, in that case, you will have a subset of the script policy, which is a subset of the protocol valid code points, which is a subset of the Unicode code points. Then when you register a domain name and not looking it up, it's of course the case that the registry have a policy for what code points you can use when you register um, uh, code points. And um, the, the policy that the register defined could be either that certain code points are allowed, it could also be equivalence tables, which means that when you register a domain name with this code point, in that uh, you also get a domain name with this other code point. So you, have, you might have a permutational, ex, uh, permuta permutational growth of the number of domain names you get. You thought you only register one domain name, but you get two extra for free. It might also be the case that if you register one domain name, the other two domain names are blocked for registration from others, etc. So, so all of these policies are actually very separate. And one of the problems in the discussion has been that people have said, oh, but this code point is something that, can, that I can use, so I must be able to do that. But what do you mean by allowed to use? Do you talk about the registry policy? Do you talk about the Unicode code point set? Do you talk about the protocol? It, it's very, very important to talk about in what context you are discussing things. And most of the time, what people are discussing is either what you can look up or the registry policy. And notice here that the registry policy is neither language or script tables. It's a separate thing. And the reason why it's a separate thing is that it might be the case that you have two different languages using the same script. And each one of those languages, and those languages use different code points in the same script. And note that it's non-overlapping in this case. So what the registry have to do then is to take, pick up each one of those registries and create a registry policy, which is a joint operation of those two policies that the two languages uh, define, which is no problem normally uh, in the case that you have two languages which have no non-overlapping uh, code points set. It might be the case the registry say that, well, when you register domain name, you have to pick which one of the languages you are trying to register domain name in, and then you can own, only pick code points from that language policy. But it's a little bit more complicated if it is the case that you have two languages, uh, two languages like this, using the same script, and they have overlapping policies, which actually is a collision. And maybe they are, they are, they are. Um, maybe it's, it's it's very hard to do join operation, but it's still the case that the registry still have to pick up both of those policy documents and try to create a registry policy. And this is some of the problems that I see as the protocol developer because I work with the, with the layer between the protocol and Unicode that you see on the bottom of this. That's where I'm working. The problem here is that a lot of people come to us working on the protocol and say, by the way, you have not solved the problem with these two languages having overlapping policies or overlapping things. And like, unfortunately, we cannot solve that problem. So how you create a registry policy based on language policies or script policies, that's really, really hard. And here I have an example where you have overlapping language policies, but it could as well be a registry that want to allow two different languages from two different scripts. And that could also be overlapping and not very easy to create the registry policy. But creation of the registry policy is really, really important, and that's why I am personally trying to push pretty hard in the idea and CCTLD process and ICAM, for example, that registry specifically CCTLDs that want to create um, uh, IDN and CCTLDs, they have to define what registry policy they're going to use. If they're lucky, it could be one-to-one -one mapping to a script policy or a language policy. It should never ever for any registry be a one-to-one -one mapping with what is allowed in the protocol. But this is where we have part of the like confusion. 
So, for people that would like to so know more about the, um, the protocol, you can look at the, at the host that I have, uh, stupid.domain.name slash idnabis. You see all the protocols, or all the documents over there, and you can also see the differences between the different versions of the document, as you see an example of here on the web page. Pretty easy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patrick. So uh, actually, as Beher mentioned, one of the myths uh, I would like to, to, to address is uh, the, the difference between a, a script and a language table, because sometimes people use them interchangeably. Uh, as, as, as Patrick mentioned, uh, a, a script is all the, 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 the code points that has to do with a certain script. It's a, a bigger range than what a language table is. A language table is the, the, the code points specifically used for a certain language. Uh, and users generally, when they uh, you uh, talk about domain names, they, they, they talk languages and they speak languages and they expect to have their domain names registered in a certain language and not script. On the other hand, at the technical side, uh, machines do not understand languages and they deal only with scripts. So whatever is going to apply on a certain script is going to be applied across all languages that use this specific script. And this is where exactly all uh, languages have to coordinate and cooperate because rules would apply across all those languages. Um, a registry could uh, decide to register domain names in one or more languages. In this case, the, the table uh, the registry is going to use should be only the table for this language or the union of the tables of the languages he or she is going to support. It is not recommended that uh, a registry support all the range of script whenever they decide to support a certain language because not all the valid uh, characters would be necessary uh, needed by certain language communities and this is only would enhance more security issues so unless the, the the characters are really needed by certain language communities it is preference that the registry focus on whatever language or languages he or she is going to uh, support um, uh, one more thing on misses uh, that has to do with this is people usually think that uh, when introducing IDNs, this would uh, allow for registering every single word in the dictionary of a certain language, which is not really true because uh, when it comes to languages that use the same script, there are some common words. Uh, and those, if registered by one community, would automatically be uh, not available for other communities. And for example, in, in Arabic, if we take it as a specific example, uh, we had to agree not to use diacritics. Uh, and by, by, by taking this decision, we already gave away some words which would have been supported by the, the Arabic language. So, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manal. Uh, and maybe before we leave this uh, layer, I, I, I'd like to also hear from, uh, from Ram and Hong, because I know that you have similar um, experiences. So, Ram, would you like to take on? Sure. Uh, no, I don't have a presentation. I just have a few comments, because I'm, I'm really interested in, in getting some, some back and forth. Um, I wanted to speak about two things. One is the um, is the example from uh, from India and some of the challenges that uh, we're facing in implementing IDNs uh, in .in, um, where we, we provide the backend services. The other is uh, to speak about some of the business. Um, uh, issues uh, that come when you're trying to implement IDN as a GTLD um, operator. So let me sp speak specifically to the Indian situation. Um, 
The, the most important thing, I would say, um, when it comes to a country like India, is that you, have, you do not have one language in the country, right? So here in Hyderabad, the local language is Telugu. Telugu is spoken by about 80 million people uh, inside the country. It's a minority language. Um, if you, it, there is really no majority language, if you will. Only 100 million people actually speak English inside, uh, with, with any level of proficiency inside of India. Um, the interesting thing is, if you look at Telugu as an example, as a language, it's got its own script, it's got its own um, uh, basis of how to represent it on a computer. But there's another language, Kannada, that uses uh, a lot of characters that are similar uh, to, to Telugu. The specific issue facing India is that um, you have, if you look at the issue that was facing China, Japan, Korea, the CJK example, um, you had different Unicodes, you had different code points, and in some cases you had visual confusion. But there was a, in, in most cases, that was a one-to-many problem, one representation um, in, in many different la languages, right? In India, the, the specific uh, uh, challenge, if you will, um, is that if you register a domain name in Hindi, well, there is no Hindi table as such, because Hindi uses a script underneath it called Devanagari, right? So as Manal was talking about, you know, Arabic uses the Arabic script, Arabic language uses the Arabic script, but you know, Urdu, which is spoken here in Hyderabad, which is spoken here in India, Urdu also uses the Arabic script, and Urdu is also written right to left, right? So. One of the big challenges here uh, that the .in registry itself is, uh, is working through on uh, IDNs and implementation of IDNs is um, if, you, if you implement Hindi, you have to also implement um, domain names in the 10 or 11 other languages that use the same script underneath it. Now, in, in those other languages, in, in, many, in some of those languages, there is no the, the linguistic and technological foundation isn't ready yet, right? Uh, but at the same time, there is uh, both, there is a real imperative and real pressure to introduce a domain name in Hindi. Uh, if you introduce it in Hindi and you don't do it in the other 11 languages, you basically uh, would end up disenfranchising these um, users of, you know, or um, speakers of these other uh, 11 languages. There is no good solution identified uh, in this so far. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the IDN CCTLD uh, fast track process where there is a proposal that, you know, a, a country in the, for the CCTLD would only get, you know, one, um, w w would only be able to pick one script. Well, in the case of India, if it picked Devanagari, there are 11, 12 languages underneath that um, that causes a complication immediately. I think it's one script per official language per territory, right? Uh, in which case there would be, um, th there are like... No, it's one, it's one name. The, stu the stuff that, we're, that the working group actually finally recommended was at least in part put in to help um, the Indian issue um, is that it's per, it's one string name per official language, um, and the the in, in, with one exception, which is that in respect to China there is a question about it being the actual reverse, which is two scripts one language. But if we ignore that just for the moment, in respect to India it is one language one string per language. Uh, per official language. So technically speaking, in the fast track, it would be feasible for India to have 20, 22 uh, names. Right, and, and that, is, um, that is very good because it would, it would solve a, a specific, India-specific problem. Um, fr from a different, as Patrick was saying, different Unicode points underneath them. Uh, and if they, they are, then as a registry or as a country, you have to come up with policies on how you're going to deal with, uh, with those variances, uh, one to the other. Because for an actual user, um, 
and, and we've talked about this, Manal and I have talked about this, if you have a domain name that is registered, uh, say, in the Arabic language, uh, and it is, that domain name is put in a, in a billboard banner here in India, in some, for some domain names, it, would, it is readable. Uh, because it's in Urdu, but it's completely readable. But if, they ty if a user went to the computer and typed it in, it would go where? What are you supposed to do with it? Um, you know, do you bundle them? Do you automatically redirect them? And at, at the IDN, uh, at, at the top level of the IDNs, um, there are some open questions in that area. Uh, from a business point of view, I think there are tremendous opportunities um, can you hold on the opportunities for sure. a few seconds? Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, Hong, would you like to share with us some mythos from China or from your region? Oh, okay, thank you. Here you go. It'd be easier if you take this, please. This is closer. So this one won't turn off. 2000, Chinese language community had suggested to ICANN to implement native script domain names in DNS. And the Chinese language community uh, has always been very active in developing technologies and the policies with respect to IDNs. It's not coming out. Yeah. No, it's 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 no. No, so, are the few slides? Yeah. Can you bring the slides up? Function, whatever it is. It's not coming here. It's only There's attention. No picture, well, yeah. it's coming actually on the main, but they disappeared. The uh, yeah. Now you lost okay. the picture. Try it one more time. Try one, yeah, one more time. Uh, it, just uh, wait, wait, a minute, there, yeah. wait a moment. There it's coming. It was coming up there. Mm. There. Oh. You, do you see yeah. the slides now? Yeah. Love. Good. Brilliant. Right. So now you can see uh, some IDMs in Chinese characters. Uh, it is second level. This is because the top level has not been open for IDNs. Um, so the top level is still .cn. It's uh, China's country code top level domain. Actually, it's been used quite widely in China, but they are at second level. This is weather.cn. It's quite popular in Chinese language community. This is because Chinese people, uh, a, a Chinese language user, we would, Latin script is not used in Chinese language community. There are some specific uh, technology and policy issues. I want to follow up with my colleagues from Arabic and, and uh, Hindi uh, scripts community. One issue is about the variance in Chinese scripts. I have to make it very clear that there are no two scripts in Chinese language. We only have one set of scripts, but we have virants. Uh, they, they can be showed either in traditional characters or in simplified character. I have some example here. It means Tsinghua University in Beijing. Um, you can see for either Qing, this character, or uh, Oh, hua, oh, xue. Uh, these characters, they have a couple of variants, either in simplifying character or traditional characters. I know they don't look similar at all. They're not virtually similar, but they are the same character. This is exactly as the uppercase letter A or lowercase letter A. Uh, this is 1,000 times more complicated than English, but absolutely, they're variants. They're not different characters. So what we're doing is we bundle these two set of virants. Uh, the language table is being developed, is being submitted to ICANN, is now recorded at ICANN. Um, so um, in the registration policy level, uh, I'm really happy to follow uh, Patrick's uh, very insightful analysis. At, regis at registry level, what we're going to do is to bundle these variants up, which means you registered either in simplified or traditional character, you will be automatically acquire the domain name in, in, the, in, in the virus. So it prevents the user confusion. There is no way for, for people to register the virus uh, without any intervention. This is one uh, special issue in Chinese language community. Another issue is on dispute resolution policy. Uh, what is very special for China is that we have a special DRP for Chinese character domain names. Um, uh, I guess this is quite special um, comparing with other language community. For most language community, you don't have special DRPs for, for the IDNs. We use the general DRPs, but China has a um, special one. 
And finally, uh, these are uh, some uh, milestones on Chinese language community in development of uh, idea and technologies. In 2000, a Chinese domain name consortium was established at CDNC. I guess it's the first one, a uh, first local initiative on IDN technology development. And in 2002, a CJK group, Chinese, Japanese, Korean group, gathered up, established a, a joint engineering team, JET. These are all local initiatives, and they have uh, fruitful outcomes, um, including uh, several RFCs at IETF. And uh, uh, particularly um, about IETF email address internationalization um, a working group, which is chaired by Patrick. Um, the Chinese language community made its own contribution. And you can see in the future, perhaps I can register in home as my real name at user.china. So it's an uh, implementation of IDN in email system. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Hong. So I think it's very uh, clear how the um, uh, uh, Patrick, you mentioned one remark in relation to CCTLDs, and from uh, I believe you were saying this from technical perspective that uh, the CCTLD and IDN CCTLD they have to have uh, a policies, a defined uh, a policy. Uh, so I want to turn this to Chris uh, and uh, uh, just to tell us how. Uh, do you see this from CC perspective and whether that was um, part of the fast track uh, uh, recommendations? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Chris Despain. Um, ID and CCTLDs, they have to comply to certain. All TLDs or. In the ca thank, yeah, so I've got that. In the case of in the case of CCTLDs, of course, it, it's a, it's a, an issue for the for the. But to see if, if people in this room actually want to ask some questions, I have I I I'd, I'd like to ask the room a question, if I may. Is it possible that who in this room has not been involved in previous discussions or debates on IDN IDN TLDs? Could you could you put your hand up if this is so, something new to you? Everybody else, thank you, sir. Everybody else knows all about it then. Okay, so it may be that the easiest thing to, to do is for us to actually see if we have questions. And I mean, I could I could talk for ten minutes about how we created the policy we created, but I'm not sure that's going to be very helpful. Yeah. Okay. So if there isn't uh, anything you want to add on the fast track thing, maybe you can move yeah, well, to. I, other if there are questions about that, yeah, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. I, I, just, I mean, yeah, right, I'll just do a setup. The fast track is the fast track is there for, for a specific reason. It became pretty obvious to the community about two years ago that there were some territories that had a pressing need for uh, a CCTLD, a country code top level domain, in in their own language. So we have worked very closely with uh, all of the component parts of ICANN to come up with a, 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 pol a recommendation for how to fast track some applications for IDN CCTLDs while um, over the next two to three to four years we are working on the full policy. Um, so perhaps the myth um, is that the IDN fast track is an opportunity for every territory in the world to get an IDN CCTLD. It isn't and it was never intended to be. It's there for circumstances where there is a pressing need. Um, and there are hurdles that you have to jump in order to get one. And those hurdles may or may not continue to exist in the full-blown policy. Thank you. So uh, the on protocol level, uh, from uh, script language level, from, from policy uh, perspective. Uh, so uh, Patrick, are there any challenges or difficulties that uh, you have been facing on, on the technical part? Uh, once again, I think the audience here, they already have heard about this, so I think the audience should ask the questions. I, have, I can talk an hour or two, or two days on my own answer to that question. Okay. A week, actually. Uh, Ram, anything from script thing, or again, we need to turn it to the audience? Well, too. I'm happy to turn it to the audience. The only, um, the only comment uh, is that um, just having a language table is, is often not enough. You, you know, you need to think about the other pieces, but that's... You know, if you think languages, but you know, computers end up working with scripts. And uh, you know, if you if you look at the the, the case in in Arabic, uh, with the Arabic um, 
uh, script IDN working group, one of the things that we've discovered is we began saying, you know, the Arabic language problems are solved, right? And as we've, as we've gotten further into it, we've realized that there are interaction issues between, say, Arabic and Persian or Arabic and Jawi or Arabic and, and um, Urdu. And, um, you know, you have to exercise some restraint and responsibility if you're going to register an Arabic language to ensure that you cover the other languages as well. Okay. Uh, anything from uh, Patrick? Yeah, now I actually need to... Uh add even more clear. code points in your code character set only. What they do use though, which is specifically a problem for the Arabic script and, and, and various right to left um, uh, right, right to left scripts, is that they're using different input methods. Mm -hmm. And when you have different input methods and display methods, that's once again once it's something completely different than the script. So neither, so both script and language, that's just metadata that is like can, might be tagged on a Unicode code point to say that this code point is used in this script or is used in this, in this language. But in reality, there are the algorithms used for display and input, which most of the time is what creates the problem. Okay. Um, anything from the regional um, experiences, Manel, anything from the Arabic? If, if we move to the, the opportunities, Rami, we're going to, to address the opportunities from, from business perspective. Uh, I think there are also opportunities from, from end user perspective. So uh, uh, who would like to start? Of course, um, I, I guess um, end users uh, are the stakeholder that will directly uh, affected by the uh, IDN technologies and policies. So uh, the people who are really going to use IDN um, uh, do have a couple of uh, concerns. But we have very high expectations for IDNs. We've been waiting for so many years. And finally, uh, it's going to go real. So this is a wonderful opportunity uh, for, for, for users. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I guess uh, there's something that I can could do. Uh, one thing, it could be a user education and public uh, awareness campaign, perhaps. IDN will bring uh, the brilliant new opportunity to make people uh, that is not English speaker to be more accessible to domain name system, to overcome the last digital miles in the information society. That, that's great. But, uh, uh, but, but IDN could also bring in some challenges and even uh, dangers and perhaps harms to users, such as phishing. This is a big problem. Uh, the people use some, um, uh, well, the mixed character uh, character says uh, domain names to entrapment uh, the users. The so user putting their personal information, uh, they uh, they could really be harmed. Anti phishing uh, could be a big issue for the implementation of IDNs. I guess this is something users really concerned about. For other issues, uh, IDN operators, uh, registry or registrars, should have a genuine connection with the language community. You're providing an IDN missing native scripts. So there is no link with the local language community. I, I doubt that, that, that they will provide really efficient um, and, and reasonable services to the local language community. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you, Hong. In, in, in a local language, right? Uh, I think that's a tremendous opportunity um, for communication for, for people all over the world. You know, I, I, uh, there are folks who are literate, but who are not, who don't know English, and if you don't know English or ASCII or can, can't use an ASCII keyboard, you know, even if you have an ID and top level domain name, if you cannot do email with a fundamental, you know, the killer app for the internet, you know, you, you have trouble. So I think there's a tremendous opportunity for, for development there. Um, as, as a GTLD op, um, operator, one of, the, one of the biggest opportunities for us is um, to, to be able to, to enter markets where, you know, th there is, in, in some cases we have markets where there is a pre-existing um, large TLD, for example, that already holds a, a strong position. And the big opportunity with IDNs is to get into a brand new market on, an, on a level playing field, relatively speaking. Uh, and be able to compete uh, directly rather than competing with some, some legacy. Thanks. Thank you, Ron. Uh, so if um, there isn't any more uh, input from the panel, then I think I can allow some time for 
uh, questions from the floor. We still have 30 minutes. Uh, any, yeah, there's a question over there. Can we get uh, a microphone? In the fast track and the, and the draft application guidebook, um, more specifically the draft application guidebook, which said that a new GTLD even for IDN would have to be at least three characters long. Now, three characters is not quite the same thing, depending on the type of characters. And if you look at the Korean character, it is actually a question of what you call a character, because what appears to be to the Western eye as a character is actually typically a combination of two or three um, uh, um, uh, components which would have a pronunciation by themselves. In the case of, um, of Chinese, of course, there are ideographs, and if you wanted to type those characters into a keyboard, you would have to have a number of keystrokes very often actually a very large number of keystrokes to be able to just type one characters that would be a rather uncommon word. You know, the typically common word would be one or two character. Some of them are three characters, but most words, most expressions are composed of um, um, uh, two if there are just one um, uh, character. So it's actually rather unfair to, to um, impose that kind of restriction. Now, I understand that the thinking must have come from the Latin characters, and that people wanted to avoid the confusion from GTLDs with CCTLDs, but uh, I think we should come up with better criteria than saying that GTLDs, irrespective of language, would have to have three characters. Can I, can I just, yeah, Chris. Can I just, um, if, this is about, about myths and, opportuni myths and opportunities. I have no idea why that's, why that's there, so I can't. Is it a minimum? Is, yeah, 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 a minimum of, a minimum of, yeah. I don't know why that's there. Uh, so. I, I was only partially involved in that, at least. Uh, I, I, was, I was an observer in that area, and I think much of the TC, uh, IDN CCTLD um, uh, working group, when we were discussing how to implement IDNs for CCTLDs, there was a lot of discussion about the fact, well, of course, one of the things that identifies a CCTLD right now is that it has two characters, uh, not up to two, two. Um, and whether that was possible to be maintained in respect to IDN CCTLDs, and it became pretty clear pretty quickly that that wouldn't work, uh, because the concept of abbreviation doesn't doesn't exist in some in some languages, in some cultures, and so therefore to to say it can only be two characters, which is different from saying there needs to be a minimum, of course, um, but but, but we, it was discussed at that level. Thank you, Chris. There's a question here. Yeah content in some of these languages is, is abundantly there, where entire pages are all rendered in the languages and code points and scripts that we've talked about. It's just that the URLs they're using today have to have ASCII characters to the right of the dot. So it's, I, I would have thought that all of the communities that have the pressing needs that Chris described are already rendering content fully in their scripts today. Uh, and they would like then, the next step is to be able to reference and link to that content with a fully native script URL. Uh, so so uh, thank you for the uh, reading stuff. So it tends to be about things like email uh, or things like IMs and chats and stuff like that. Um, and I expect that the, uh, the, the development of IDNs uh, with local language will actually lead to, a, uh, to an explosion of, of content because local language communities um, where expertise is in that local language uh, alone, uh, I expect that input mechanisms will get better. Uh, I expect that application vendors, um, you know, ought to see anyway some uh, increased reasons uh, to develop software um, that will actually provide for an easier way uh, to, to, to write content uh, together. I think if email um, actually takes off with IDNs, um, all the email programs need to be able to, to render them properly. Uh, I think that will lead to some significant uh, improvements. The, 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 the fundamental thing is that while content exists, um, I, I'm not making the case that you need IDN TLDs for more local language content. I'm actually making a, a, a somewhat uh, different point, which is existence of IDN TLDs uh, reduces uh, another barrier uh, for access to content, whether it is pre-existing or whether it is newly developed. And I have just a small follow-up to that. 
that they've rendered their local content in there in CCTLDs or in GTLDs or both. And, uh, you know, that discovery would tend to lead us to know whether to serve that community, whether, whether they're going to really want to be boxed into a CCTLD and under IDN, or are they going to want a .org in Urdu because they're currently using a .org in as a discussion, is that, um, that there is such a pressing need in some territories that they're actually saying, whilst we understand that it would be great for us all to get together and have a script table across three, four, five, seven, twenty territories, uh, our IDN CCTLD is for our country, our territory. So if we use our language and our language table, we're comfortable with that. Um, I, I think that uh, there's a there's a there's a, uh, um, a desire amongst ter territories to cooperate with to cooperate with each other, but the need is so great uh, that they're not going to be prepared to wait for a finalisation. And Ram's quite rightly said. I mean, in the, the, everyone a year ago was saying, "Oh, well, the Arab stuff is basically done." Uh, well, it ain't, um, and there's a fair way to go. But the Saudi Arabian stuff is basically done. Right. Um, because that's all they, that's what they want it for for their for their uh, now I'm not sure that, that actually addresses your your second point my, my view is that actually because of the language script um, issue uh, that that leads to a likelihood of um, names being registered in the CCTLD um, because actually it's harder for the G's Patrick. Um, yeah, once again, if we go back to my kind of join between different script tables, different language tables, or whatever, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, there must be a registry policy that makes sense for the people that want to use that top-level domain. Uh, and let me just add one: having someone who who maintains Urdu content, you know, buying an Arabic uh, a domain name in the Arabic language, as long as it looks the same and it reads the same as uh, as Urdu, and then develop the content. So that tends to follow just whatever is available, and and that's one of the one of the tensions that I can itself is having to deal with because you have GTLD sitting there saying, hey, CCTLDs are on a fast track, and uh, they're going to develop, you know domain names out there in, in local languages, G's are, are behind and, uh, you know, I, sh shouldn't, they be, shouldn't there be some attempt to make them go together? At the same time, there's a, such a pressing imperative uh, from, from on the CC side to just keep, keep things moving. Uh, I think there is going to be some really interesting um, outcomes as a result of it, but if, if you just look at where things are in the GTLD space, COM is out before everybody else, and COM has, what, 70 million domain names um, out there. Uh, the next largest is NET, that has 15 million. The next largest is ORG, that has 7 million. So if you look at ORG versus COM, you know, there's, there's a gap of you know, it's 10 times uh, an order of magnitude difference, right? So there's a concern, uh, at least that ICANN is dealing with, um, that, that says, hey, um, people are going to want this. If they want it and they develop content, they're going to go with whichever is available first because lots of folks don't care uh, so much. Content developers don't care nearly as much about the TLD. They care much more about the content. Okay, there's a question Good there. Question. Uh, uh, my name is Guo Wei Wu from APNIC EC. I was involved in the IDN since uh, the English. But if we are talking about reality in the business or reality in the, uh, uh, the, the IDN impact to the society or to the user, to the company, I think we are talking about very different things. Because uh, one of the simple uh, company name or, or entity name, you have a many more than maybe Ten or different kind, uh, ten more different. But in in another sense, you actually create a more how to say that a burden for the company to to make more reservation to protect their own company name uh, in case of the people steal it or whatever. And from user point of view, actually, I do agree. You know, uh, it, it, the IDM maybe can help them. But we do understand that the user have another tool. It's not necessary to go to the IDN domain name because they can go to the, the search engine. They can go keyword. They have many different tools. You can do it to you know, access the contents. And the follow-up is uh, you know, 
in this moment, at least, you know, I, I, I agree the one you are talking about is uh, IET, which is working on the mail server and mail um, IFC to resolve the issue. Because right now, if we look the IDM developer right now, it will go through a fast track next year. It's still not a perfect domain name because you only can do URL. What about the other function? For example, the telnet, FTP. Although this day not many people use it, but we, we still understand that the IT and the domain name is still have a very limited usage. Uh, if you ask uh, the, the you know, registrar level, it's not a complete domain name yet. So it's still you know, a, a, a certain way we, we need to work it out. So I think basically I would say it's a very good try and a very good you know, uh, approach. But I would say from my point of view, it's still a very long way to go. Thanks. Okay, uh, when Chinese language